Welcome to the diff. We need to start making more conscious material choices. I set up an initiative called Make Fashion Circular. It's a tsunami of change. Hello, yes, welcome back to The Diff. My name is Joe Isles, and you're joining us here for Remanufacturing Components, Reimagining the Economy. The show today is in two halves. We're going to start off looking at something fairly practical, a pretty down-to-earth aspect of a circular economy, remanufacturing, how we can take products or components and return them to as good as new or maybe even better than new condition. And then in the second half of the show, we'll be zooming right out and we'll be thinking about the whole economy, how, how it could work in a completely different way towards different outcomes that benefit people. As always, use the hashtag ThinkDiff throughout the show to send in your questions. I'll have Diff All Start Seb capturing those and sending them through to me and I'll put them to our guests uh, throughout the discussion. So first up, we're going to take a look at remanufacturing, and I'm joined here in the studio by David Fitzsimons. He's the director of the European Remanufacturing Council. Oh, David. Hi, Joe. Good to be here. Welcome to the DIFF studio. Now, you advise governments and businesses on remanufacturing. You're part of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation Circular Economy 100 network and uh, advocating recycling, increase, uh, remanufacturing and increasing remanufacturing understanding within that network of businesses and, and governments. But for those of us who maybe have a bit more of a kind of pigeon understanding of what remanufacturing is, help, help us define the term. Lovely. Yep. So uh, remanufacturing is first and foremost taking back a product um, that or a component that has had some life or at the end of its first life, take it back put it through an industrial process to disassemble it and then to clean it, take those components that have worn or broken, replace them, reassemble, test, put it back on the market as if it were new or as good as new. That's remanufacturing. The important point is that it's an industrial process, not just a, a one-off. Okay, and, and so when we say industrial process, you, you mean something we could happens at kind of at scale at, at many scale. times yeah at scale many times standardized so i guess the clues in the word as well when we think of manufacturing yep. you would think of a production line perhaps many things being made in an identical way something that has been refined over the course of the industrial revolution and remanufacturing is like doing that but bringing old things back to back to life yeah it's the thing i think the way to think about it is we're not after material recycling we're trying to keep the product or the component in life for longer, principally because if you're just after smashing things up to get the materials back for recycling, there's an enormous loss of value when you start to smash things up. So instead, keep them as whole as you can mm. and put them back to use again. That's the purpose. So is it, you mentioned recycling, I mentioned it in my garbled intro to the session. <laughs> is it... An either or situation. No, no, no. There must they be a lot they, they of confusion between the two to, um, the, to the uninitiated. Yeah, yeah. It, it, there is confusion there, but it, the, the two complement one another. Recycling and remanufacturing uh, come together because invariably things come to the end of their lives or they're no longer useful. You want the material recycling to happen. But remanufacturing comes with so many advantages. So let's take some tangible examples. Uh, lots of products, especially in the 21st century, uh, contain um, small quantities of very important functional uh, compounds and materials that make that equipment work well. Think of lots of electronic equipment, for instance. Um, but not just the electronic equipment. Think even of a, something as basic as a tyre. Um, tyres in their production use cobalt. Um, and in electronic products, there are things like rare earths, often mentioned, 
um, but lots of very small quantities of compounds which are necessary to make them work. And if you take them back and just smash them up for material recycling, you lose all of those small amounts of compounds and they tend to get down, they get lost in the ferrous mix and the non-ferrous mix and you lose them forever. And it's a bit like, and it, we've got a kind of mildly crazy economy where we've accelerated entropy. So in, when, when these compounds were in the earth and you mine them to get out these very small but very important precious materials to then use in our equipment, if you smash them up for recycling after a short life and they get lost in ferrous and non-ferrous mixes, you'll never get them back again. It's far, it was hard enough to find them in the earth, but you'll never get them back from those mixes. And that's what manufacturing helps to prevent. At the same time, many companies are working really hard to plunge more money into recycling technologies. And yes. many of them are very proud of that. They're, yes. they're um, reports, sustainability reports, things like that will, will tout great recycling figures. Uh, that seems to be a bit of an aspiration for, 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 for some businesses. Yep. So you, do you have to say to them, stop, what you, stop recycling, oh, stop sometimes, doing it? Sometimes I'd say, are you sure that that's the best thing to be doing? It can suit a business to say, we want to sell you a product, we want you to hold it for as short a time as possible, then we'll, we'll take it back, smash it to pieces and start again. It's, it's a much more challenging thing to do, say, we'll take it back because we're going to recover components mm. to use in the next product, or we're going to upgrade this product so that you can, we, somebody else can use it again or that you can use it again. Okay. And so I, I think right now most remanufacturing is in the business to business world. The big challenge is how you get it out of business to business into the business to consumer world. And so there are lots of lessons we can learn from B2B, business to business, to apply if we're going to take on this challenge of making it more normal for a product as part of its life cycle to come back to have its components or itself whole to be put back on the market, mm -hmm. remanufactured. Well, we'll talk about some of the uh, consumer reaction to remanufactured yep. products a bit later. Yep. What sort of products are we talking about though? What well, are currently remanufactured? Mm. Well, I think I'd put them into um, a, a number of categories. The first thing are those traditional products that have been remanufactured for a number of years. Uh, people may not be familiar with them, but I guess things like transmissions in vehicles, um, engines, turbochargers, suspension, steering components, all those are remanufactured. But think also of um, things like um, but printer, printer cartridges, for instance, can be remanufactured. Um, Lexmark, for instance, they take back their cartridges, put them through an industrial process, as I've described, um, and then put those printer cartridges back on the market. They try to keep them as whole as possible. They don't just refill them, but they put them through an industrial process. So there are, there are these traditional remanufacturing activities. I think, for example, SKF doing their ball bearings and industrial bearings, they are remanufactured. Um, and that all goes, goes on quietly in the background. And then increasingly we're seeing a new range of products which are being brought back for remanufacturing or in new business models where the remanufacturing becomes an important part of that business model. Mm -hmm. uh, if I could take an automotive example, uh, Volvo is a good example of um, a company that sees how we are changing the way we're buying vehicles. So they want to, instead of selling us all an individual vehicle, car, Volvo car, they're expecting to sell their cars to an intermediary for shared ownership, particularly in urban areas. And then remanufacturing becomes part of what has now termed uh, value retention as a way of keeping the costs down for managing those assets over a number of years of life. So they embed that remanufacturing activity as part of the value retention in the shared ownership model that they're moving to. Okay. And you said that 
it kind of quiet, some, sometimes remanufacturing quietly goes on in the background. Yes. Do you think that most people or do you think people might be using or have used remanufactured products without even knowing about it? Oh, for sure. So um, I've never once flown on an aircraft and the pilot says, just to let you know, ladies and gentlemen, about 30% of the components on this aircraft will have been through a remanufacturing process. In fact, the aircraft industry have some of the best remanufacturing activities on the planet. High-speed trains too, same processes, but nobody likes to talk about them because, well, I guess at 30,000 feet, you don't really want to hear about, um, you just make, you want to make sure the remanufacturing has been successful. You don't want it to break whilst you're at that height. And presumably you mentioned those industries because those things, those products are really expensive. Uh, typically, they are very value? high value, and that's why it happens. But also, there's a safety consideration there because the planned maintenance around an aircraft or a high-speed train, you don't want the component to break in use. So the planned maintenance is there to ensure that it comes back, is remanufactured and tested and put back into service again before it breaks. Okay. And the... You've, you've been working on improving understanding of this and, and maybe we just linger on that for a moment the you said that if people were told that some of those components were remanufactured when they're 30,000 feet up it might uh, not be music to their ears <laughs> uh, that's because there's there are these misunderstandings or preconceptions yes. around what re remanufacturing yes. is so what are you doing to try and change well, that? Well it's a pity isn't it that we've got these some of these really high quality um, businesses that are doing this in the aviation sector, the high-speed train area, the automotive sector, um, the, the industrial bearings area um, for, for aircraft tyres and all of these areas where the work is really of the highest standard and yet the consumer perception of what remanufacturing means is I think out of date, a bit backward looking I think your average person thinks of remanufacturing as an old product that's being kept alive and it's very dirty. Do you have a sense of why that, why that is? Was... Um, I, I think it's almost been accidental. I don't think there's been, any, there's been any concerted effort to change those perceptions and to see the value of remanufacturing, which is partly why, Joe, you'll know that... Um, well, we'll come to the launch in a moment, what we're doing today and what we're trying to do to change those perceptions. Well, look, why, don't we, why don't we tell us about it okay. now? So okay. this is part of the Circular yeah. Economy 100 uh, network. Yeah. So this, got it with you. this document I brought with me today. We're launching it today, aren't we? And uh, better than new, it's been a, a co-project through the CE100, Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Um, it's, it's involved a number of interviews with companies who believe in remanufacturing, uh, led by uh, Michelin, the tyre company, but involving also a Teleplan, a Schneider Electric, um, Lexmark, Solvay. Um, if I've forgotten anybody in that list, forgive me or remind me. But they, they all contributed to the... Got them all, actually. Good, okay. <laughs> Full list. And um, we interviewed them all about what they're doing about remanufacturing, and then pull together the themes, um, particularly about perception. Why is it that some customers don't see remanufacturing positively? Why, and what could we do about it? And when we reflected on that over several months, we thought actually a good way to start this is to give the title of what we're putting out today, a very short document today, call it Better Than New, because that's quite, uh, in itself, the title is quite um, contentious. You'll find some technical people who say, well, that's, an Im that's impossible. How can you take back a product and make it better than new? Because there'll have been things like metal fatigue that require you to test and it can't be better. But that's rather missing the point, isn't it? The product is better than new when it comes back because it gives you all those added benefits that, that smashing it up, recycling it, or going to do more mining to get materials together to make another new product for you just 
don't have. So the remanufactured product comes with a much smaller carbon footprint, much less waste. Do so you mean it's much better, better in, not just in performance, yeah. but better on a number of other factors as well, depending yeah, on what the, you... It, you step two, two steps back and look at the wider picture, you end up with a smarter economy, which is um, the products have got a, an extended life. And that's what remanufacturing enables. That's what it's about. And <clears throat> when thinking about that, that idea of better than new as well, could it, be also, could it also be said that if someone has taken back a, an old product yes. and gone through the very detailed process that you mentioned at the yep. top of the show, um, that those extra levels of, of checks... Um, that could help with reliability, I'd imagine, yeah, or does. something one like that. One of those quietly, one of those little facts that p people would never know about, but generally, uh, in most product categories, the remanufactured product has got a, a lower failure rate than the new product. So there you are. But who knows that? Nobody. Uh, who, who's asking? Not many people. So better than new sounds like it's pretty catchy. Congratulations. Thank you. You've, yeah, you've done well there. Yeah. Um, can you foresee this becoming some sort of uh, mark on products for, for customers walking down the aisle in a uh, electronic shop and going to the better than new section oh of... well wouldn't that be nice <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I look i don't i don't know about that i think a lot of people think you need a label to say look this is better than new this is remanufactured i think there's some new business models coming which will make it just embedded into the business model you, you won't need to ask it will have been remanufactured. It will work. You don't need to ask. But I would, I would love to be able to communicate more clearly to people that you should look for a remanufactured product, demand one because you get so much more than a new product offers. That's right. There's, there's, those are odds, right? You, you, you said that it goes on quietly in the background. Yeah. Yep. Has its own positives that we've all used remanufactured products have. without even having to be a conscious choice. But at the same time, you want to raise the profile of remanufacturing. So it feels yep. like there's there's some there's some work to be done there. There, there is, and, and look, the, the fact of the matter is that the linear economy has had 150 years of legal framework built around it to make it cheaper, faster, as reliable as possible. And what we're asking to do is to change to an economy where it's more normal for a product to come back and to have a second life, parts of it to have a second life. That's normal. And the legal framework around that is not yet there. It is a, it is a constraint on a lot of businesses starting in this area, even when they see a good opportunity. They, they don't get funding from the bank because the lawyers would say, be careful, et cetera, et cetera. It's one of the things we're identifying and saying we need to change that. If we're really serious about this new economy, we can't just trundle on with the same old regulations, rules that we've had for the last hundred and developed over the last 150 years. We'll come on to policy and regulation in just a moment. We've had a question in from Gary. Thank you, Gary, who has asked, is remanufacturing a bit niche based on some or based on some specific industries, aviation, automotive? Um, yeah. He's got a point, hasn't he? We keep hearing about the same old things, engines, gearboxes, yeah. brake, brake discs and things like that. <laughs> Gary followed up by saying, what's the most surprising product that can be remanufactured? Yeah, great. That's a, good, that's a great question. Because generally speaking, it is niche. Right now, of any equivalent manufactured product that is remanufactured, and there are very many more examples than automotive um, that I've given, it's only about 2%. So only about 2% of a given product that is remanufactured is typically remanufactured. So still niche, very small. The real question is, how much bigger could it be? And in, in, in my view, it could be significantly Well, there's this uh, statistic in the document that's been released today. It has the potential to triple in size by 2050. By 2030. By 2030. Fact, yeah. My notes are wrong. Uh, so as long as we got the we've got the right framework in place, there are a lot of products that could be which aren't at the moment. They haven't been designed appropriately for it, but could. So, so it's some novel some things that you wouldn't re recognise necessarily. There's a lovely business called Alec, uh, A L E C. No one will have heard of Alec GmbH. It's a German business. They take back. Um, 
the tr it's, it's an automotive example, I'm sorry to say. I'm have to give you some other examples. <laughs> I apologise for that. Poor Gary. Um, yes, poor <laughs> Gary. I'll give you a couple in a second, Gary. Um, where there's a very sophisticated um, control device. Uh, what, what's nice about the remanufacturing of that, which comes back from Audis, uh, that is disassembled by robot in a clean room environment. So absolutely a lovely example of what you can do with capital investment rather than labour um, through a standardised process. And so I'd recommend them as a nice way to look at where we're going to go with the processes. But by way of products, people think this is only for expensive products. It's not. Um, I've given the example of uh, toner cartridges, for instance. They're very low value, and yet they are designed for remanufacture, but not very many are most are dumped or recycled. They're not remanufactured, but could be. And if you like, they should, they're a symbolic product of how many more like that could we remanufacture? A lot of IT equipment is remanufactured quietly. Servers, for instance, um, that happens in the background. You wouldn't know about it. But very few uh, consumer-facing electronics are remanufactured. But Teleplan, is a company um, who are members of the uh, Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Teleplan take back telecoms equipment to refurbish and remanufacture. So they're doing it. They'd like to do a lot more. Does so, that help? Yeah, Gary? I think, I think yeah. that helps. Gary, let us know. Uh, has that uh, satisfied <laughs> your appetite for different examples of remanufacturing? Yeah. We've got a couple of minutes left, and I just want to. Uh, change gear a little bit, look at some different aspects of remanufacturing. If we're going to hear about it more, um, it's not just about the products and materials, there are probably some other considerations. You mentioned this um, uh, sterile clean room to, where robots disassemble things. Yep. A lot of people think this is going to be the answer to, um, the, to jobs, jobs uh, security in the future, the, a positive employment picture because we've got more and more people remanufacturing things. What's the connection between remanufacturing and jobs? Oh, okay, so the new economy, as we're describing it, would include a lot more disassembly and value retention. So a key term there, product value retention. Um, we don't really know how many areas where that could happen and how many jobs it would create. But um, my view on that is there would certainly be far more, far more jobs in that value preservation work than associated with smashing stuff up and recycling it. We just don't know how many. Likely to be a significant number, but that depends on the capital intensity, where it's located and what scale. So I don't have an answer for that, really, in Wait truth. I'd like to have one, but I haven't really got one that I'm <laughs> sure about. And then lastly, I, I was saying before we kicked off today that, um, that probably the, one of the first, my first awareness of remanufacturing was going to a remanufacturing uh, conference in oh. World Remanufacturing Summit in Germany. Yes. And uh, it was a pretty uh, a homogenous group. Yep. Uh, lots of male, white engineers, yep. uh, very, very serious. You're, you've spoken a bit today about changing the perception of remanufacturing. Yep. Uh, what's going on on that front as well? Right, great question. Uh, I agree. Most of these conferences, technical conferences, are white men with grey hair, a bit like myself, <laughs> actually, which is a shame. Um, I, but there we are. But look, there are some great women working in this area, too, who just don't get called out enough. So we all know about Nabil Nasser in the States. We all know about Walter Stahl, of course. Um, we remember Rolf Steinhilper in Germany. But actually, the women in this area are important too. And I'd say, number one, I'd talk about Nancy Brocken, who was at TU Delft and I think is now at Lund. I'd give her a call out. I'd say Peggy Zwolski at Grenoble University in France. Really good. We should see more from her. Um, and I think um, probably there are others too, but I think if I'd, I'd start, I'd say, yeah, and also Yan Wang, I suppose, here in the UK, down at the University of Brighton, a real advocate for remanufacturing, um, which, um, but, but people, these, these women are typically always, they're not at the front of this discussion, and they should be. We're tr we want to give them a platform to say, if we're going to change the economy, let's not forget 
that we should be bringing new voices to this as well. So these are some of the people who are changing the way that we make things and remanufacture things. Yep. David, thank you so much for joining uh, us here on the Diff today, telling us more about remanufacturing uh, and giving us an overview of where remanufacturing might be going in the future. Thank it's you been very a pleasure. Much. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, David. So we're going to change gears again now, and we're going to zoom out from remanufacturing and factories and products and engines, and we're going to look at the wider economy. And to tee us up is Kate Rayworth talking about her vision for a different type of economy at the previous diff. I think there are two design principles we need to put at the heart of the 21st century economy. The first one is to be regenerative by design. And I think that's where my work really closely fits together with the work of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, because it's about creating a circular or cyclical economy in which resources are used and never used up. But the second one is to be distributive by design and to ensure that value created is shared far more equitably than it is currently. And for me, the key thing is that these go together. I don't think we can have a regenerative circular economy that is not distributive by design. There's a danger we head towards circular elitism. So I bought my hose pipes to tell this story. So look, here's, here's the linear degenerative 20th century economy in which we stuff resources into the end, we take those resources, we make them into stuff we want, we use it for a while, we throw it away. This is the cutting against the cycles of the living world. So what does a, a business that does this needs to do to be part of the circular economy? Close the loop, create a closed loop system. You know, here you are, you hold that. So there you go, you need to hold it in the middle. There we go. So, you know, we sell you our products, please send them back and we'll refurbish them and sell them again, right? We've got a closed loop economy. Okay, let's say that's one clothing company. And there's another clothing company. Oh, we're making, you know, our clothes as well. We want to be part of the circular economy. So we're going to close our loop. No, hold it. No, oh, no, okay. no. You have I to keep that. No, that. you're not finished, mate. So right, there we go. Now we've got the beginnings of the circular economy. Okay. Now imagine if every company in the world was doing this, say, send, send us the things back and we'll recycle it. And we had these individual closed loops. You see, it's cute. You look cute, Joss. But I thank you very much. Nature Chris. would never do this. Nature would laugh at us. OK, pop those down. That is not going to get us to a circular economy. Nature doesn't turn a daffodil into a daffodil or a, a robin into a robin. Nature does this. OK, so this, I believe, is the ecosystem approach to a circular economy in which all companies are deeply interconnected in a web of material reuse. That was Kate Rayworth speaking at the diff about her vision for a different type of economy uh, inspired by nature. And when you th we think about the economy today, if you want to think, find out how the economy is doing, you look at em economic growth, don't you? You look at GDP, is it growing by 0.1% today, 02 But our next speaker says that the ways that we typically measure the health of the economy isn't delivering the outcomes that we really need. So if we could have different ways to measure what we want from the economy, then we could maybe help steer it in the right direction. I'm joined by Catherine Trebek, Policy and Knowledge Lead at the Wellbeing Economy Alliance. Welcome to the diff. Thanks, Joe. Great to be here. So we just heard from Kate. Um, she's obviously a leading thinker in questioning whether the way that we perceive, the way we measure the economy is fit for the future or is even yeah. fit for right now. Yep. And, um, and are we all ambassador? Very, very proud to have Kate on our side. Ambassador and friend. You agree. You agree with Kate, seeing as she's an ambassador of we Indeed. all. Indeed. So you also don't think the economy, the way that we measure the economy is fit for the future? No, no. We've got an economy that's so fundamentally misaligned in terms of how we measure its success to what people and planet really, really need. We've got an economy that's set up and geared up in a way that's not fit for delivering the sorts of lives and the environmental regeneration that our, our current daily lives currently need. And if I can just click on to, to the slides, I'll go back to one. I mean, everyone could pull out their favourite indication that we have progressed massively in the last few centuries, the last few decades. People would point to how we've eradicated certain diseases, uh, our gender equality is, is getting better, literacy rates are going up, young kids are surviving through childhood, you know, life expectancy is going up. We could all look at that and think there has been undeniable progress and so often that occurs when 
the benefits of growth are used and directed to addressing poverty and they're channeled into the sort of public institutions that make life better for people, whether it's education systems and public health systems. But we're now at a point where we have to look at what's going on around the world and ask this big question, are those fruits of growth beginning to rot? And we see that with the extent of environmental breakdown, that it, the fruits of growth are you know, really dangerous in terms of how we're putting pressure on the planet, um, putting, heating up the planet in terms of you know, eradicating biodiversity. So across a wide range of environmental indicators, there's, there's some serious alarm bells ringing. There's, well, if I could, if I could just yeah. jump in there. So the, you mentioned that a lot of people might think, well, the economy's kind of working fine. We've got the, the fruits of uh, kind of prosperity. Um, obviously, that isn't the case for everyone. There'll be many people out, out there in, here in London, around the UK, around the world, who say, well, the economy isn't really working the way that they feel it should. But I would imagine that their reaction is, can we fix it for me? Not, not can we fix it for biodiversity or climate change? Can, can you make sure that I've got everything that I need? Uh, a roof over my head, meal on the table. So I think, I think people are starting to realise how deeply connected those two stories are because so often, whether it's here in the UK or whether it's around the world, we see that it's the people who are struggling the most in an economic sense in the current system who are also those who are going to be hit hardest by the impact of environmental breakdown. And whether it's low-lying communities in, in island states in, in, the, you know, in the Pacific or whether it's communities out just you know, up the road here in London who cannot afford flood insurance or who, who is you know, experiencing the, the water out of their tap is not fit to drink. It's the poorest communities time and time again who, hit, who get hit hardest. And so the confluence between the environmental crisis and the economic and social crisis means that we have to address those two together. And we, we often talk about that it's, the fruits of growth are becoming dangerous in an environmental sense, but it's an also desperately unevenly shared harvest in the extent to which there's you know, global inequality, but also you know, within cities, within the country, you know, like, like the UK, we see the, the wealth and the fruits of the growth being siphoned off to those who have already got a lot. And it's and those the rest of us, you know, living standards, wages stagnating, and for some people even life expectancy going down. So we've got to ask some pretty massive questions about this recipe that we've used in the past. Is it is it fit for the future? You know, do or do we need to actually really redesign the economy? And and we've been started to look at how much money and resources and political effort goes into coping with the fallout of this current system. And, and there's, a, there's a term we, we use, it comes from social policy and sort of marketing and manufacturing, this idea of failure demand, that demand on services is driven by our failure to create good lives for people. I mean, this example is a, is a good one, the spending on the, the face mask because our streets are polluted. But you, it's a bit like an onion. There are layers and layers to this, whether it's spending on some of the accident and emergency of treating people on Friday night because they've you know, drunk themselves in, into oblivion, or whether it's some of the criminal justice system, or whether it's pressure that's been put on the NHS because of loneliness or people self-harming. And also in an environmental sense, ecological economists would talk of defensive expenditures and whether that's cleaning up after an oil spill or rebuilding people's homes after they've been flooded. All those sorts of aspects show that just how much of our current economic resources go into coping with the failure. We're sort of trying to fix and heal and treat and just try to you know, cope with and patch up like that sort of sticking plaster seems that that's the best we can cope with. And that's why at the Wellbeing Economy Alliance, we're really saying it's time to ask much harder questions and, and raise our gaze to can we do things better the first time around? That's what we're about. And presumably, so, so if I can try and summarise that, you, you're saying you're trying to fix those problems before they, before they start, so um, improving people's lives so that they don't have to rely so much on the kind of safety nets of of society, keep them healthy rather than treat them when they're sick. Absolutely, and I often talk about it as getting the economy itself to do more of the heavy lifting, saying we, we want more out of the economy in terms of fair distribution of resources, in terms of ensuring that people have enough to get by so they're not having to turn to the state to top up their 
poverty wages or top up their housing benefit or we're not constantly having to invest our sh collective resources in cleaning up after the, the sort of oil spills and so on. And so really say if we redesign the economy in a way that shares things better first time around so that we don't have huge gaps in income and wealth disparities, and we're not just trying to close that gap and a little bit of redistribution, but actually we have an economy that from the word go design, distributes things much more fairly. And, and there's lots of nice examples of that. And the, the word that I keep coming back to is, and it's a rather ugly term, but it's really useful, is pre-distribution. Can we have the economy pre-distribute things in a way, rather than just waiting till five o'clock in the afternoon and then turning our eyes on government and saying, right, can you fix this and redistribute things because the economy has run rampant. It feels like that is the, is that the, the crux of it? So we, we hear um, almost every week that the, the new records are being broken for the amount of cash that's been hoarded by a smaller mm -hmm. and smaller percentage of the global population. Um, they're not really investing it. It's not being spent on infrastructure. Yeah. It's 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 squirrelled away it's in someone's bank. And, and driving food, you know, food price spikes, for example. So is is that the, that's the that's if that was your if you could make, wave a magic wand and, and you know, or you had one wish that would be that would be the one surely. I don't know. I shy away from that. There's one easy, easy solution. I, I think if the sooner we understand that this is about a jigsaw of solutions and certainly turning our attention to how the financial system operates, which is you know the plumbing of the economy, where investment goes, that's a key part of that jigsaw, how we redesign businesses so that they are owned by workers or owned by communities. So they're not geared up in a way to increase returns to shareholders who, if, you know, let's face it, shareholders you know, are usually lucky enough to already have a bit of money. Mm. And, and so every pound that's extracted to them is a pound that's not going to a worker or it's not going to a local community or it's not being invested in environmental protection. So that's part of the question. So looking at how do we repurpose and redesign businesses. But it's, a, it's how do we do infrastructure? It's how do we price things? How, what do we tax and subsidise? So the silver bullet, tempting though it is, I think will take us to too narrow a focus when actually this is a question about complex system change. I'm going to take a question that I usually would save them for a bit more of our, our discussion first, but it's, I think it's an important one from Jess who said, how much of a challenge is, is that, let me rephrase that, it's about the word economy. Uh -huh. it's a, Jess says it's a bit of a black box, a lot yeah. of people don't know what it means, how much of a challenge is that? No, it's a really good question Jess, thank, thank you. I mean the economy is everywhere. It's how we get our wages. It's often when we're spending, you know, food and so on. It's but it's also outside the formal marketplace. It's how we care for each other. It's a gift economy. It's it, I mean, it, it's everywhere. And, and in a way, though, it's become people have become masked because it's been dressed up in these fancy, complicated economic indicators. And when people talk about the economy, they think about just the marketized economy, things like GDP or profits or house prices and so on. The way I get my head around understanding the importance of the economy is thinking about if you and I were wanting to walk across a stream, the goal for us is to walk across the stream. Now we'd need sort of little stones to put our feet on. That's the economy. It's not the end in itself, but it's a fundamental part of getting to the ultimate end. And so we need enough of those stones, so we need enough resources to be shared equally. They can't be slippery or, or wobbly. We won't have a chance of getting across to the other side. But the key thing is that so often the economy has become the end in itself. We've, we've misconstrued ends and means. And I think that means we've got a whole lot of policy choices that have been skewed towards growing the economy as measured by GDP, rather than saying, what is it that really, really matters to us? It's getting to the other side of the stream. It's good lives for people, people having enough time in their community, people feeling safe and secure, people feeling a sense of purpose. That's the ultimate goal. And the problem is we've sort of with this, sort of, economics, the way it's currently understood, has taken our, our gaze away from that. So the changes that you're talking about are, there's almost nothing that's more profound than, than some of these, these shifts. Yeah. What does Wellbeing Economy Alliance do to, to try and, well, and, and where did you actually get started? <laughs> well, we start because there's a lot of amazing work. Can I click this through? Maybe just click it through. So the, the Wellbeing Economy Alliance is about recognizing that at so many, thank you, so many of the root causes of so many of the challenges facing our world, we come back to how the economy is designed, how it prices, what it incentivizes, how do people have enough resources. So we've got our gaze firmly on changing how the economy operates. And we understand how we're going to have a fighting chance of transforming that. 
as epitomized by this rather lovely tree. Part, it's going to be fed by bringing together all the knowledge that's already out there about why things are wrong, how things can be done differently, whether that's in practice or in, in li academic literature. So bringing that knowledge together. Another key route to that is changing our imaginations about a better economy, that it can be done, that it's feasible, that it's desirable. And that's the stories and the narratives. And they feed this idea of a power base that's about thematic clusters, working with businesses, working with finance groups. It's also power base around citizens. So we've just launched something that's an amazing platform called We All Citizens. And we're working also with local hubs. So there's We All Scotland, there's We All Canada emerging, We All Costa Rica. So there's lots of ways of feeding that power base and that ultimately will lead to system change. And I actually, I actually love the different way of looking at this. In a sense, this, this is really our theory of change, this idea that if we work together with all these amazing diverse groups out there who are already rolling up their sleeves and trying to transform the economy, and you've probably had all sorts of different speakers throughout the diff who are doing this, our sense is that there's great work happening. If we can work together, then we can do extraordinary things. And that's what the Wellbeing Economy Alliance is really about. And you mentioned a few geographic hotspots. We've got to talk about New Zealand. So yes. people might have heard that New Zealand now have a well-being budget. Mm -hmm. Yep, just brought it down last month. You'll be able to explain it much better than me. <laughs> what, what's happened? So what, what New Zealand has done is they've, they've said we have to shift the way our budget operates. And they've said, we've got five goals. They're things like a digital economy, a low carbon economy, supporting Maori cultures, attending to child poverty and mental health. And all government departments, so that the head of the police service, I imagine, the head of the roads department, even head of defense, all those government departments, when they're putting in their bids for government resources, they have to speak to those goals. So they're really starting to bend the spend, if you like, according to these dimensions of what really matters to life of you know, New Zealanders. And it comes from a recognition that New Zealand's gross domestic product, which is the usual way that we look at the health of the economy, and it's actually the proxy for how we understand how, how good a nation is. We've been so attuned to thinking if your GDP is big, then you're a developed country, congratulations. New Zealand ticks all those boxes. But in another sense, they've got huge levels of youth suicide, mental health crisis, homelessness, the environmental footprint is too high. And so they've said, well, let's not just look at those fairly orthodox economic indicators. Let's turn our attention to what really is making such a difference for, for Kiwis. And let's use the budget to change that. I, I once heard this beautiful phrase that budgets are moral statements with numbers attached. And I think what Jacinda Ardern and her finance minister, Grant Robertson, are doing is taking that challenge and saying, well, can we redesign the budget? So it's going to be really exciting to watch how that experiment f the, plans out. The political opposition, so take it with a pinch of salt, their criticism was that this is a marketing exercise, this is savvy branding, because this is what governments do. They figure out what the, what the needs of, the, of society are and where they're falling short, and that's where they, that's where they spend money. Well, and actually, to give credit to the, the opposition, the, what the wellbeing budget that's just come out now is based on is something that was developed under the previous government, which is the living standards framework in the New Zealand Treasury. So they've actually got a hand in it. So it's, it's, it's a shame they're dismissing it. And, and to a degree, there's something in that. I mean, governments, they will protect national parks, increase living wages. So they will take decisions that su support other, other goals. The challenge is that GDP as a measure of progress is so ubiquitous in, and it really it constrains our thinking. Even if you think about how we define a, a, a crisis, an economic crisis, it's incremental declines in GDP. I mean, we should be thinking about an economic crisis as when numbers of people are going up, turning to food banks, when people are feeling their financial situation is insecure and precarious, when people's paychecks does not help them you know, lift, lift them above the breadline. That is a financial crisis. And yet, in GDP terms, it's only when GDP comes down. And what GDP does, it narrows our gaze, it incentivizes that sort of sticking plaster downstream attention that we were talking about earlier. It doesn't incentivize prevention, the sort of getting that right the first time around. Presumably, we're still a long way off well-being being valued above GDP, though, it, it, can you, uh, we're, we're getting there. I mean, that that when, this is one of my hopeful days because I'm here with you on a, on a Friday and we're, we're having good <laughs> conversation. But but there are moves getting there, and I think what's changed in the last few years is that there's a really quite broad-based 
understanding that GDP is a pretty flawed measure of progress. And, and feminist economists have been saying this for decades, ecological economists have been saying this for decades, and finally that conversation is going mainstream. People really get it now. It's not if we need to replace and go beyond GDP, it's, it's the how. We're now at that next, next frontier. One so of that's the good things about discussion. GDP is that it's measurable, um, arguably. It's something mm. that can be summed up in one number. Is, it, is this... Is well-being measurable? Yes, yeah. I mean, multi... How are people doing Yes. I mean, well, it's sort of... There's a broad-based understanding of, of well-being. Some people would suggest we can just ask people how, how happy are they feeling, how content are they. I'd say that's one important component, but it's not enough. I think we should be looking at people's quality of jobs, their sense of meaning and purpose, as a green space around them, their distribution of income. There's a whole lot of, lot of figures that actually are probably already measured by the Office of National Statistics. The challenge is they're not on the in-tray of the finance minister when he or she gets to work on a Monday morning. They're not the top of the lips of the Radio 4 news presenter the day after the Chancellor brings down a budget. Wouldn't it be brilliant if after a budget we had the, the you know, John Humphreys on Radio 4 saying to the Chancellor, what's this going to do for levels of loneliness? What's this going to do for numbers of people turning to food banks? And I actually, I have this dream that one day what we'll measure instead of GDP will be the number of girls who ride their bikes to school. Because imagine if that number is going up, we know that they're getting their breakfast, the streets are safe, there's schools nearby, parents can afford bicycles. So there's lots of figures that are out there. It's just how we use them and how we report on them and how we hold policymakers and politicians accountable and businesses accountable to those more richer measures that are better aligned with what really matters to people. Catherine, thank you very much for joining us here in the DIFF studio. That's all we've got time for here today at the DIFF. There is one more session coming up, but that's all from, from me, from Catherine and David for now. Keep the conversation going using hashtag thinkdiff and we'll see you next time. Bye bye. We need to start making more conscious material choices. I set up an initiative called Make Fashion Circular. It's a tsunami of change.